Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Baltic Star After Hours. Ewan is with us in circle form only at the minute. We're, um, there appears to be bad old internet in the world of uh, Ospringe, which is where you and uh -oh. I live. And oh, he's kind of back. Um, I'm suffering all kinds of dropped frames at the minute. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm worse, yeah. I'm worse than a clumsy painter. <laughs> um, but um, we're going to battle through regardless, as we have important wisdom to impart on you tonight. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope we've all gotten into the Thursday night spirit around the Baltic Star Bar. I hope we've uh, nestled in with our drinks. I hope we're feeling relaxed. I'm Luke on the end. It's summer's come, so therefore I have to live in basketball vests and shorts, even when it's rainy and nasty. Ewan's at the other <laughs> end. It's a, just a pleasure to see him there, really, even though he's just vanished. And Ben, as always, <laughs> holding us together like the glue in a sandwich. I love I love doing sandwiches. <laughs> glue sandwich, yeah. they're my favourite sorts of sandwiches. You, you, and, you and I certainly have different definitions of what makes a good sandwich. <laughs> Speaking of strange combinations, what are we talking about tonight, Ben? Well, I mean, more or less anything, because we tend to ramble a bit on these Thursdays. However, we did set out with an agenda in mind. No, there's only one item on it, an agendum in mind, <laughs> um, which was to discuss um, the skills, because Traveller is a sort of skill-based system, and anyone watching the adventures of the Baltic Star will know full well that we spend an awful lot of time saying check this skill or that skill so a quick chat about how they work and then going through them and what they can be used for because it turns out you guys use them sometimes in a slightly unorthodox way <laughs> that doesn't sound like us Ben <laughs> <laughs> surely not <laughs> like, like who, who died and made you the, the rules arbiter um <laughs> I think by definition. <laughs> I don't think technically anyone had to die to do that. It was just, you know. <laughs> Greyhill, in fact. Greyhill died to do that. Greyhill died so that you could arbiter. Too soon. It's still too soon. <laughs> yeah, I can't make jokes about Greyhill. <laughs> yeah. So, um,. Broadly speaking, uh, Traveller as an RPG doesn't have levels. It doesn't have character progression in the form of levelling up. And you don't generally, as you develop your character, get sort of new features or new feats of any kind. Your, your progression, basically, is down to learning new stuff. And... Those, those things you can learn are skills. And you, you learn a bunch of them when you are um, rolling your character to begin with. And then you, um, you can develop them over time by, by learning them during your downtime. And because Traveller, often you spend quite a lot of time on starships, and on a starship it takes a week to go from anywhere to anywhere, more or less, um, you've often got a fair amount of downtime during which to decide what skills you want to learn on that leg of your journey. And then when it comes to checking them, basically, um, you pick the relevant skill and look at whether you've got uh, a, a value in that, like a plus one or a plus two. And you pick the um, relevant underlying characteristic one of the six basic characteristics that defines the character and look at the bonus you get from that which might be minus one or zero or plus one and plus two depending on the character traveler has a fundamental rule which says that even if you don't technically have a skill you can have a zero in a skill which means it offers no bonuses but you're vaguely familiar with that skill you don't have any particular talent in it and if you have nothing in that skill, it's a minus three. And then you roll against some arbitrary difficulty set by the capricious whim of the referee. <laughs> um, 
so some things you'll say, okay, you've got to hit an eight or a 10. He often actually doesn't tell you what you've got to hit because that would sometimes be giving the game away. But in his mind, he thinks, okay, this one's easy. It's going to be a six you've got to hit. And then you say, right, so I roll two dice and then I add my my personal characteristic value, the bonus for that. And then I add my plus whatever or minus three um, to the to the uh, the skill value. And then if it comes out six or above, you um, you succeed. And if it comes out above six, generally the difference between what you roll and what you needed to roll is called the effect. And it can act as a sort of bonus. You can do things a bit better or classier or more elegantly. Like, so that's a, how it works. like a somersault, Fun. a backflip or something, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. And we will we will go into the benefits of the Jack of All Trades skill when we get to it, because that is um that that actually kind of breaks the rule a bit. Um but other than that, it all works the same way. You've got a value, you've got a hit, you roll two dice, you add your underlying characteristic, whatever it might be, you add your value in that skill, or minus three if you've got nothing. And uh, if you hit the number, you succeed. Not in itself complicated. And thankfully, very fast when you're actually playing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Like we know generally it's everything is like two dice. Unless there's a boon or a bane or whatever, it's two dice. You know it, if it's a pretty much standard thing, you've got to hit an eight. And then you sort of know what your skill is going to be adding. So there's not too much maths. There's not too much confusion. It's pretty much similar every time, I guess, in that regard. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the the only thing we do really that is, well, I suspect every referee does this, actually. If you can come up with any sensible way to make a particular characteristic and skill combination make sense, even if it's not the one I originally thought made sense, if you can come up with a reason for it, you can usually do it. Though... Um, I will say sometimes the reasoning is sufficiently convoluted that I think, <laughs> okay, if you're going to do it that way, it's going to be two points harder. If you know what I mean, the difficulty is going to be a bit harder. <laughs> yeah, which I think makes perfect sense. You know, if you're trying to do something in a less than optimal way, or you're using an obscure skill to try and do something, sometimes yeah. it is going to be more difficult to succeed, isn't it? Yes. I mean, there are obviously times when an obscure skill is exactly what you need. But the being obscure means those are not going to come up all that often. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's beautiful when they do. And I think there's, looking at the list of skills in front of me, there are skills we have not yet used, either because none of us have them or they've not come up, because some are quite niche. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And there are certainly things that I think either Stefan or Ragnar have that I'm not sure have come up. Mm. Um, because, as you say, because they're niche and the nature of, uh, probably the nature of what we decide to do. I yeah. suppose being a role-playing game, it's up to, it's up to us if we constantly avoid situations where we could use, I'm trying to think of a good example now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our philosophy <laughs> for, for example uh, it's just been used yeah. to good to good ability it has, no that is that is one that has <laughs> been used most definitely Lang we haven't used any of the language skills yet that's for sure yeah that is true that is definitely true steward I don't think we've uh, stewarded anything no, it's because we um, we haven't needed to serve any drinks or sort of help people out or sort of <laughs> get them dressed or show them to their room yet, really. Yeah. So, is the plan to sort of touch on each of them, kind of go through the list and see how we've used them? If we've got any stories of it, Ben, or like how you? I, I think it so. Off? What? Or actually, in some cases, they're going to be genuinely unfamiliar skills. And maybe the, the thing to do is to think in terms of how how might they be used? Because there are some we'll never have come across um, and others that we will have actually used. And some of them in occasionally unorthodox ways. So, yeah, let, well, let's let's set out and at least begin with um, with the first couple that we probably have never used. 
so that we can get the rhythm going and know how we're going to yes. do it. Oh, the rhythm. Let's get the rhythm going. The rhythm going. <laughs> the rhythm going. So the, the first one is the admin skill. Neither of mine have got admin skills at all. Um, Agnar does actually have one one skill in admin. Hey. Does he? Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Right into the storyline, Ben. Which I don't yeah. think has come up. So this is broadly speaking coping with bureaucracies. So whenever you encounter the the officialdom, you can you can make an admin check as long, of course, as they are acting in an official capacity. So if it's paperwork or regulations or whatever, um, that's where you're going to end up using it. It's relatively uncommon for you guys to be dealing with the legal authorities legally, as opposed to <laughs> skulking around their edges. <laughs> yeah, which again is our choice as, as role play, yeah. role play goes, I suppose. Isn't we, it? The we, fact don't, that we... we don't deal with them, we overthrow them. Yeah, if we come across authority <laughs> and bureaucracy, it tends to it's, we tend to not take part. <laughs> <laughs> that's just beyond us. <laughs> not interesting. It's either below yes, us or above I, I, us. I'm I, not sure which. I do get that feeling that when you're confronted with a form, you read it carefully and then say, "I reject your reality and substitute my own." <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly what we do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, th there are. Admin has no um, subcategories. There are there are no um, sort of sub skills within it that you have to choose when you select admin. So you get the whole admin. Um, it's one of those things I suspect um, would be of a great deal of use in some environments because there are going to be some worlds or places you might encounter where you really do spend a lot of time, you know, dealing with the authorities in a in a strictly legal sense literally filling in papers and getting work permits and things like that that may well happen um but mostly the places you've visited have been a bit more relaxed than that so far yeah mm. not many officious places full of passport controls and fill in this and quarantine regulations and no, mm. they've been very and, and to be fair as, as you've said when you do encounter places like that you 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 fix that by overthrowing that authority and replacing it with one more to your liking. It's the easiest way of doing things. Let's face it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, I I, th I think the world would be a better place if everybody got up in the morning and their first thing they thought was, "Is today the day I set about overthrowing my government?" Mm, absolutely. Not today. <laughs> That's how I wake up most mornings. <laughs> yeah. Then I'm like, oh, many, you know, it, it all just, many hurts, today. <laughs> to be fair, we normally have at least one meeting with the person in charge or somebody who has a second-hand story about the person in charge. Yeah. Make mm -hmm. a snap judgment about their character based off of a small snippet of, it, small snippet of information uh... and then act upon our judgment. <laughs> yes. yes, interview the first <laughs> random street hoodlum you encounter. <laughs> He's not a fan of the existing authorities, yep. therefore they must be overthrown. Yep, good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does tend to uh, tend to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sticking in kind of the same area, advocate. So this is lawyer, basically. Um, mine either. It is. Yours, you mm, Agno again has uh, one in there. Of course he does. Advocate. Okay. Yeah, which well, kind of makes sense, I suppose. It, it does wrap up. <laughs> yeah, he he's he's a very um, he, he's a a very by the book guy, at least traditionally. He's now travelling with a slightly looser crowd, but this is a a senior military officer, mm. and and yes, debating and legal experience and what have you is something you would not be surprising to find in a senior military person. Um, and again, this doesn't have any subclasses, so basically you've also got benefits for things like um debating and public speaking um and if you decided to instead of just overthrowing the government actually become the government it would be handy for being a politician as well um and then we get to animals which is the first one that has these sub specialities and we should just explain, if you get a skill with a subspeciality, you have to pick which of those specialities it applies to. So just because you've got animals, it doesn't mean you've got all of them. So basically, animals means animal handling or 
veterinary skills or oh. training. Oh. So training is about how you um, convince a vicious alien squidling to be your friend. Uh, oh, that would have been useful. Um, <laughs> it's going to be useful on quite a few occasions, I feel. Sue, sue the giant shark. Sharks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Instead, of in, explain to the giant shark that instead of eating us, it should jump through that hoop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then obviously veterinary, I think, sort of kind of self-explanatory, really. Obviously, it's um, it's medical services for the animals. And then handling... Um, is in essence as much about riding them and using them in a working environment as it is about anything else. So it, it's, I, I think you might think there's an overlap between handling and training, but I think the basic is that handling is for animals that are already domesticated, mm -hmm. whether or not you can ride them and whether or not you can um, calm them and look after them, as opposed to actually taming them from the wild. Right. That makes sense. That does, it does but make sense. But I, 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 I don't I don't think do, I mean do any of your characters have any animal skills? Not mine. None whatsoever. No. Okay. Well the next one of course That's is why something... we always end up in horrible battles with them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's why. Yep. The re the that, reason the giant one. shark wanted to eat you is because you didn't have animal training one. He was actually trying to talk to us, he just didn't <laughs> understand what it was saying. He, he just wanted his freedom. We should have helped him to jump over the uh, jump over the dam. <laughs> yeah, thousands of meters. Standing, yeah, standing on it, holding our hands up. Oh. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it would have been something that that Kara would definitely have wanted to get on film. An enormous <laughs> thirty meter long shark or sixteen meter long shark hurling itself over a dam to plunge thousands of meters to its death in a forest. <laughs> Oh, it would have been so happy for Definitely a would have needed the uh, veterinarian veterinarian <laughs> skills after, more after than, that. More than a one as well, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I get I get the feeling, to be honest, after such a plummet, the, the, the veterinary skill would have been less useful than the janitor skill. <laughs> <laughs> the chef. The chef skill. The chef skill. <laughs> yeah. So... Moving on to one where we actually do have some real-world experience, art. And there, there are five subcategories here. Basically, performer, which is acting and dancing and, and singing. Um, holography, which is photography, obviously. Um, uh, but also um, video and, and the like. Um, playing an instrument. Uh, visual media. Uh, paintings, sculptures and things like that. And naturally, writing. You know, narrative and knowing which end of a pen to hold, that kind of thing. Very important skills. I think art are the most important skills in the whole game. I, I think you could make a case for them being <laughs> the most important skills in life. Yeah. In the game, I suspect <laughs> they come in just a smidgen behind gun combat. <laughs> that says Kara's got better art skills than gun combat <laughs> skills. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, Kara's a visual media one, isn't she? She's got she's got visual media, she's got performance, and she's can play an instrument somewhat. So she's okay. filled up her three art slots already. Oh. She went to she was at art college and then became an artist. So that and computers was her way forward. Yeah, and I just thought, why not? It's a bit different, and we've used them. She's painted things for people. Um, when Stefan wanted to have a little postcard painted for the lady on Ossin, yeah, we used yes, visual media. Um, not used her instrument yet. We tried to use the performer, I think, when we jumped on board that Shakespearean thing. At, um, yes. At, uh, fuck, that didn't go down too well. She rolled okay, but it didn't no, go you, down too well anyway, to be honest. I think you sort of failed a fast-talking kind of role, didn't you, and were ordered off the stage. After I'd been doing all my <laughs> magical things. But yeah, vis visual media's definitely come in handy. I've used it a few times for things. It's a mm. good skill to have, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and, and there are... I suspect there are a fair few overlaps on this because obviously for the purposes of the game, they've got to treat them as different technical skills. But I think we all accept that if you can um, 
if you if you're okay with visual media you probably at least got enough composition to make your holography more than awful um i would guess um if it's anything like photography people who are good at art more generally tend to shoot more creative photographs not necessarily technically better but <laughs> but better creative. composed than everything yeah and i see it like she can do stuff she could bang up a website she could have sort of her twitch channel could be full of you know interesting art and sort of look good at least you mm. know her youtube intro video would be like whoa hey i'm cut whoa. so yeah yeah so i see it yeah for sure yeah definitely absolutely um yeah we don't we don't have a writer in the team do we no i was just thinking i'm quite upset that neither of mine have that now i could imagine that being a great way to spin some stories to talk yeah. yourself out of situations well when you finish well, yeah. next training finishing next training then we'll, <laughs> then we'll <laughs> bum around for four weeks and then you spend four weeks writing week. yeah there you go Be done. Mm. yeah and interestingly some of the examples they give like um well they, they give two examples including as, as i'm sure you're aware they, they've actually written under right as one of their examples writing the new edition of traveler as something <laughs> with a skill check <laughs> which they specify as a formidable level challenge 14 or better it has a bit hasn't it yes um, but the other example they give is composing inspiring or interesting pieces of text including rousing the people of a planet by exposing their government's corruption yes. propaganda that's <laughs> Writing a political pamphlet is right up your guy's alley. Yeah, it right. certainly is. Get on it. If I build up my three art slots, I can't have another one, can I? Um, there's actually no rule about it. I think it's just the way they've structured the character sheet, because most people don't. And, and um, interesting. You, you, you can have, I think, as many different skills as you're interested in. Uh, but it might be that if Kara's focusing on the more visual stuff, it might be for someone else to focus yes. on literature. I like it. They can work together. Yeah. <laughs> Ben's like, right, I've, I've, I've worked out a two-year mission for you guys. You're going to fly into the heart of this rift and discover some ancient things, some terrible things. Well, nah, we're dropping pamphlets everywhere. <laughs> well, I'm going to form an underground rebellion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I must confess, even as we were discussing this, I was thinking you could do something really astonishing with this, like have a party in which you specify that at least one or two of them have to be gifted writers <laughs> and then send them on a, a a point by point recreation of science fictionalized um the odyssey homer's odyssey <laughs> so each of the islands he visits gets turned into a science fiction version and the gist is at the end there's a check to find out how well they write the epic poem <laughs> to discuss <laughs> that journey. this is well like within wheels idea. this is beautiful it's a good idea start making notes here we'll talk about this tomorrow we'll have our friday morning <laughs> chat about how we can turn this to our advantage yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the benefit of science fiction you can put anything in it <laughs> yeah yeah okay so the next skill astrogation now this is one of those rather more everyday skills yep. um and I don't know. Do any of your characters actually have astrogation? Soraya has. Um, yeah. She she got that in um, character development, of course, because of uh, being a scout. Yeah. So she picked it up from there. But we don't use it because we've got a better astrogator on the Baltic Star. That's right. I mean, at the moment, you've got um, a group of NPCs who travel with you who fulfil a few of the basic technical skills necessary to operate the ship including an experienced captain and an astrogator yeah. and for those who don't know how this all started that's because when they originally joined the baltic star it they were as regular crew on a mission which already had most of the senior roles on the ship filled yeah, we, um, we were just bodies but really. when yeah, but when that sort of fell through, they were the group that inspired the idea of just keeping going and turning it into a a, a trading ship and an exploration ship and going off on their own adventures. So they kind of became the the instigating force on the ship, even though they didn't start out as the people in charge of it. Um, 
though Stefan actually started out, I think, quite senior in practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some in uh, yeah in practice in in some form of deception. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he he was sort of involved in recruiting all of the other people mm. <laughs> to an extent. <laughs> yeah. And then we get on to another biggie, which is athletics. Um, and that comes in uh, three flavours. Um, dexterity, endurance and strength, which are, of course, they, they each match one of the three characteristics, the three basic physical characteristics. So if you need to do an athletics check in Traveller, which for D and D players is basically the same as either athletics or acrobatics. You um, you pick the relevant characteristic, your strength, um, endurance, or dexterity, and then your skill in that area. Um, and obviously, you add the bonuses together. And if you don't have, you know, if you're theoretically very strong because you've got a, you know, a strength that's very high in your characteristic, but you never actually bothered to study even slightly the strength skill you may be very strong but you're not good at using it because you're rolling to a minus three this is i've i'm very this is part of my game where i'm very very weak at i think um ewan's are definitely stronger i think i've got both have deck zero and that's the only athletics they've got and considering kara's strength is minus one it means she rolls at minus four on any athletic mm. strength checks mm. which is uh, which is painful but we seem to mostly go through decks it, i feel like we've hit dexterity more than any of the others yeah yeah i mean you you're mostly doing dexterity based things like you know climbing through windows or what have you as opposed to um endurance based movement um mo you know you haven't done a lot of wilderness treks going over a long time I will say, however, we did have um, a couple of interesting strength rolls during the shark fight when you were trying to haul yeah. someone out of the water <laughs> over the side of the boat. Well, she nearly went in, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, those were a couple of tense rolls. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah, they definitely weren't tense. Yeah, but again, I think... Rolls. <laughs> and the lack of numbers led to some, uh, led to some good, good role-playing moments. Or, you know, as you say, <laughs> some tense... Tense moments in the uh, encounter. Mm. Definitely. Yes. And then we have the broker skill, which you have actually used sort of indirectly, haven't you? Yes. I went for it after watching... Um, it might have been a Seth Gorkowski video, I think, talking about Traveller, and there was a chapter on trade. And... I brought it up to you, didn't I? Because you were talking one evening about wanting to branch out a little bit and adding a bit more depth. And I was like, oh. So I started car training in Broker. And then I was like, can we start trading? And your, your eyes sort of lit up over the screen. And, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, you may. As he rubs his hands, it goes to a new section of the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I think it, we haven't done a lot of it yet. Uh, but it can add a certain amount of um, of interest to each new world. Hmm. I think it's picking up steam, isn't it? We need to. I I I envisage it getting to the point where we have a varying number of supplies of different things on the ship, and we can pick and choose what is most appropriate to sell on the planet or on, and then yeah. perhaps buy something. If, on the planet to replace it and then move on to the next planet whereas i think at the minute we're sort of we got the ores haven't we i think we've just picked up 50 ton of ore or something just to give it a trial um, run didn't we i think yeah the, the the truth is i think the picking multiple things and then seeing what they go for on the next planet is the way to go um what what you did at the first world was to like look for the best single deal you could get um and you did get a good deal on oh, on the ore well, that, you, well, that you purchased. Um, but it was quite a limited world in terms of its options. Yes. Um, and this one yeah. is a, a bit less limited, <clears throat> but still is quite narrow in its major exports. Um, but there are worlds, of course, that are massive um, trading hubs where you can buy and sell practically anything, and, and many of them at quite good prices. 
Um, so there, you may well be able to pick up a, a hold full of all sorts of interesting stuff and then find out what sells at the next world and at what price when you get there. You know, take a real punt on it. Um, but as you've also discovered, it can be reasonably expensive to buy tons and tons of these materials. So it may take a while before you've got enough float to properly do mm. that. Well, it's, it's classic, isn't it? If you, you know, you can take a big risk and perhaps not spend as much to possibly get a larger reward or you can spend lots of money um, in the view to getting a slight return on that but because you've spent so much you in theory get more back yes that's a very bad way of describing it but <laughs> <laughs> i think it, i think it came across <laughs> no so, risk you have to spend more to to see the same amount of uh, return yes i think that's on. that's basically it if if you if you pick up something that's fairly safe it tends to offer a narrow margin but a fairly reliable one but the bigger risk you're willing to go for the bigger the margin could be um yeah and then we come on to one that you've definitely used more than once which is uh, corrals oh my favorite now corrals is basically talking with the drunk <laughs> <laughs> well, we do it to each other every friday and thursday so we get used to it uh, i mean while it is absolutely true that I, I, you do have a couple of your characters with um, with corral skills, don't you? Yeah, Kara's big on it. Sarai's got it at least. Stefan mm. does. Stefan, yeah. So, so three of your four characters have corral skills. At what kind of level? Twos and threes? Just a one. Uh, two for Kara. Okay, so ones and twos. Um, for for our viewers, I will point out that while the Three of our four characters um, may well have um, have corrals one and two. All of our actual players and referee have <laughs> corrals well in the tens. <laughs> it's important. It is it an area skill. we truly excel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, it, it is, of course, I mean, the, the idea is it's supposed to be at parties and under drunken environments. Um, however, we've we've sort of taken that to mean anywhere that's fairly informal people don't actually have to be completely off with the fairies in order to make corrals make sense um and it is interesting that the examples they give here specify that if you decided to enter a drinking competition you should do corrals <laughs> with endurance ah <laughs> where Whereas gathering rumours at a party should be corrals with social, yeah. which makes like sense. We've done stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We did. We did corrals. Well, we did corrals and decks for the beer mat game. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I was going to say. Yeah. And I have a vague feeling we've done corrals with um, intellect as well on one occasion, where it was at a a lowbrow sort of place, and you argued that social might actually not be the way to go here. Yes, that was you and. I think you sort of spot. I can't remember where it was, but you spotted that. I think you kept tagging her out of it. I think she said there was no point in him going in because more of a Stefan place. I think it might be an Onosim. <laughs> mm. It sounded right. That sounds very possible. <laughs> yeah, it could well be. Um, and then we have deception, which is um, the examples they give are predicated on two basic things. It's all one skill. You don't have to sub specialize, but they talk about deception in terms of dexterity and deception in terms of um, sort of intellect or social. So, so one is, you know, trying to hide a card when playing poker is deception with um, dexterity. Um, and, and the other <coughs> is obviously trying to um, outwit somebody with a disguise or a, or a, a ruse of some description. Um, but I can imagine ways of making almost every characteristic be a deception characteristic can't you that that seems like one where those examples only just scratch the surface yeah definitely um i mean i guess it depends on what your what you are in theory what you're lying about well yeah i mean for example so, like, intellect is easy you can 
spin a story about something to make you sound as though you know what you're talking about in an inter intellectual situation. Yeah, quite right. I mean, I would argue that um, resisting interrogation, for example, might be deception with endurance. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, holding out. And you might even say that, you know, pretending to be someone you're not in a like someone more of higher rank or higher position than you in order to fool someone might be a social call. Mm -hmm. uh, but pretending to be someone who is um, knowledgeable about something, you know, if you're trying to uh, break into a medical facility by pretending to be a doctor, um, then it's possibly deception with education. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, or the equivalent of intimidation, I could very much see being strength-based. Yeah, absolutely. Deception. Yeah, that that would very much be deception with strength, I would think. Yeah. 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 So I think deception is something where you can use anything if you can justify it. Yeah. yeah. And And then we get to one of the slightly weird ones, which is drive. And obviously there's nothing weird about the skill to drive. <laughs> What's weird is the subcategories. <laughs> which are and I quote hovercraft um, mole track walker and wheel yeah. now wheel track walker I think might come up quite often mole seems less likely to me somehow <laughs> is that like um, underground kind of channel? Well, it must be mustn't it Exactly what it is, yeah. Yeah, it's it's things that crawl through the earth as opposed to on the earth. Yes. And that, you know, obviously it's science fiction. There, there may be plenty out there, but I would guess that's not a common one for <coughs> travellers to pick when they're drawing up their characters and they draw the drive skill. I'm pretty sure they look at it and almost nobody goes for mole. I'm guessing. <laughs> I, I definitely didn't. I went for track. Mm. Unless you've got some sort of backstory, I guess. Mm. That yeah. makes sense with it. Yeah. Um, yes, it would definitely have to come with a reason, wouldn't it? I spent um, years on a mining planet. Yeah. Yes. And then electronics. So electronics, they, they break cheerfully into um, comms, you know, communications, uh, and computers, um, remote ops, and sensors. So... Comms and computers, I suspect, are pretty much self-explanatory. When they say remote ops, they mean like drones and remotely piloted vehicles. Mm -hmm. And sensors are obviously working radars and sonars and, and other receivers um, that can detect things. Um, now, you guys have got a lot of computer and some comms, I think, between you. Well, you say between us. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got computers... Kara's um, got computers and comms, and Sarah's got good sensors. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Stefan and Agnar, any at all? No. No, <laughs> no electronics whatsoever. Yeah. Absolutely none. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Yes. And then it's we slide. Like a fair amount, but it's all Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And now, uh, obviously, and got a laptop almost... as well, so that helps, of course. <laughs> yes. Almost all of those checks are going to be, what, intellect or education or dexterity, I guess, depending on what you're doing. But, um, but <laughs> because, let's face it, not many computers require great strength to operate. No, thank goodness. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> kidding. Maybe <laughs> some kind of AI that you're trying to interact with. Maybe yes. endur endurance if they're downloading music using Napster in the 90s. <laughs> oh god yes yeah you, are you guys old enough to remember when if you like tried to download a picture it came in lines across yeah. the screen mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yes. yeah halcyon days yeah that that was um a different era yes thankfully we don't have to worry about that anymore <laughs> no, although um, I, I think even that is quicker than uh the frames are working on this stream tonight. I think that internet would do better than this one. Yeah, it could be. Yes. 
Yeah, mind you, we don't have that screeching sound when the modems connect, so you know, oh, swings them round about. Yeah, you can pick up the not that we have a house phone, but you can pick up the house phone and make a call without <laughs> someone shouting, "Put the phone down! I'm on the internet." Because exactly. whatever you were doing on the computers just paused. <laughs> yeah. yeah, happy days though. <laughs> yeah. Innocent uh, yeah. times. Yeah, so smoothly moving on from from electronics, of course, we have engineering <laughs> engineers. So they have categories for the maneuver drive on a starship, the M drive, um, the J drive, the jump drive, which is a sort of interstellar drive, um, life support systems um, and power, which I suppose without any difficulty cheerfully explains to you that engineering, as far as travel is concerned, is all about engineering on spaceships. Um, there are other skills that cover non-spaceship based engineering mm -hmm. because apparently spaceships are so different from everything else they need a completely separate thing and engineering officers are of course a thing oh the baltic stars got two indeed yes yeah um and that's barely enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you, you do you do occasionally you know put them in peril so huh? mm, well that's true yeah. it's it's in the back of my head that should um should either of mine die and I have to uh, roll up a new character I'd quite I'd quite enjoy playing a Scotty I think yes. <laughs> you mean like a Scottish yeah, person mean... like a dwarf <laughs> not all dwarfs are Scottish <laughs> not, not all Scots are dwarfs no, hang on a sec. <laughs> <laughs> You, you mean the you mean the you mean the Star Trek character Scotty, not the tiny dog Scotty, right? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. this could be a little animal. Although, yeah. yeah then we'd have fair. to get because, handling skills. Because Agmar is already a Scotty in one. Yeah. Episode. <laughs> <laughs> Gra so we then have an explosive you skill which suits you guys down to the ground. Yeah. You know, you you guys are always blowing things up. Yeah, none of mine have it. No, <laughs> Agma, Agma has explosives too. Ooh. We should we should explode more things. I think we should explode think. more things. I'd not since um, pre-stream have we attempted to explode something, and I'm not sure it worked on that occasion, did it? <laughs> well, the explosion worked. In fact, you you guys made a rather remarkable ad hoc explosive gas mixture um, in a laboratory on a yes. world that really only has a number um which is pre-stream as you say and that um i suppose it worked in one sense and not in another sense mm. you know it, it did in fact explode it didn't necessarily achieve everything you were hoping it would with the explosion yeah but also i think there were, um was there a, on the same planet later on wasn't there an explosion in an atv <laughs> That took it took a few attempts, took like three times to so, try and <laughs> Soraya handed over Soraya kept handing her if it's just laying plastic unstressed, I think we were generally saying Soraya could just put the plastic somewhere. That wasn't an issue. But mm -hmm. because there was this gloop, we were like, uh, we need to put it and you was like, Agnar can do it. So I handed him the plastic. He goes in all he goes in all cocky, leans up to stick it on the ceiling, immediately falls off. Into the gloop. <laughs> <laughs> Reach down, get it again. I think, and then we just threw it in. I think, if I remember correctly. Just... Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That was a fun session, though. That was a good role playing moment. I enjoyed that very much. <laughs> yeah. Was was that immediately after you managed to crash the the the, the ATV? Yes. Mm. yes. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think the one we were trying to blow up was crashed in a ditch by the side of the road and we may have joined it or was it the other way around did we crash and we wanted to make off with the one that was at the side of the road yes yeah. <laughs> we were rubbing it something like that it, it turns out there must have been a dangerous curve right there yes <laughs> a lot of gravel if I'm black right. ice yeah gravel <laughs> yeah. um so then we have flyer which is the direct equivalent of the drive skill of course and again, therefore, it also has categories. And again, I suspect some are very much more common than others, because um, I'm suspecting things like um, grav vehicle. 
you know, air rafts and the like are probably very, very common choices. Mm -hmm. Um, Rotor vehicle for helicopters and the like, probably fairly common. Winged vehicle for, you know, conventional aircraft, probably fairly common. I'm thinking ornithopter. (laughs) (laughs) An aircraft, a mechanical aircraft that flies through the flapping of its wings is probably not all that commonly chosen as a skill. Not since since the 1800s. Which are feats of of engineering in their own. In their own right. (laughs) Yeah, they are. And the, the other choice you've got as a speciality, of course, is airship. Which up until quite recently, you'd have said, well, we're never going to see an airship. You've actually travelled on one several times on this planet. Exactly. We could have stolen one if we had the skill. Agnor actually has airship one. (laughs) Does he? (laughs) That's why he has the Earth Park annual pass. One of these days, he's just going to take over to keep flying. Yeah, he certainly does. This is fantastic. Um, (laughs) So, so, yeah. Airship one. (laughs) Don't How un- on earth has that happened? It is backstory. <laughs> I'm guessing you haven't trained it, have you? So that's a backstory skill. No, yeah, I haven't oh. trained it. It's obviously through his uh, military career. He obviously picked yeah. up a flyer at some point, and I decided to choose airship. Yeah. yeah. Sounded yeah. to you, though. You probably watched, Slightly uh, more regal. You probably watched some Indiana <laughs> Jones the night before, I would imagine. Yeah, quite possibly. <laughs> and you never know. I mean... The, the simple truth is, you are travelling to weird and far away worlds. You never know what you're going to encounter. Very that is very true. Yeah. Um, so then we move on to Gambler, which is one of those ones that sort of um, breaks the the meta a bit, doesn't it? Because in addition to having the the use with intellect and whatever to try and um, win a game of poker or win whatever. We've actually had games that we play within the game where we've rolled dice to achieve something, to represent a game of cards or something like Mm. that. And Gambler can give you a bonus to your rolls on those. But the other thing is Gambler allows you um, a particular um, thing when you're in training, which is you can roll plus one in your cash benefits roll at the end of your character generation. Um, so a gambler essentially leaves character creation with, on average, a bit more money, um, which is, you know, handy, potentially, um, especially when you start out. No, for sure. When we had about 3,000 credits each max, I think. Something yeah. Something ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Back then it, it was, uh, it was a very big deal. And then we have Gunner which is the heavy stuff. Um, Turret um, screens like, uh, you know, defensive shields and black globes and things. Um, Capital ship guns. And one of the options is artillery. Um, Not artillery. 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 Is that for for shooting down ornithopters? (laughs) Or mounted to ornithopters. (laughs) (laughs) Big heavy on the wings. Guns. <laughs> You've got to have good dexterity. Really good. Or a weapon that simply fires ornithopters at the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> ornithopters made of ore. Yes. Uh, no, it's none of those things. It, it, <laughs> is, it is a word I think I've only ever encountered in Traveller. Um, and what it means is um, orbital weaponry, so planetary bombardment from a ship in space. Mm. But I don't think I've ever heard it called artillery anywhere other than in Traveller. <laughs> oh, the, ca- yeah, the coward's yeah, no, be... Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, th- then, then we have, um, mm. after that, um, gun combat. Now, I think it's fair to say gun combat is something that this team and almost every team uses a hell of a lot <laughs> it's important isn't it it's very important yeah uh, there are three sub specialities archaic for primitive weapons um energy weapons um and slug weapons so broadly speaking lasers plasmas and things like that are energy weapons and um rifles and pistols and you know 
Gauss weapons and things like that are slug weapons, basically. Um, so archaic weapons. Do any of you have archaic at all? No. Is that like bows and arrows and stuff uh, like that? Yeah. Yeah. A any any range weapon that you don't just lob at somebody with your hand, like bows and arrows and um, blowpipes and slings, I guess, that kind of thing. Crossbows. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That'd be quite a fun one to have, I guess, if you had a character. The character, I was, you know, the character I've been thinking about as that sort of useless kind of character. Who's just a hobnobber kind of guy, someone yeah. that, someone that's a bit like that, but or or an academic that has studied up on ancient ways and is very proud that they can use a mm. rapier and a bow, and then gets destroyed <laughs> in any normal fight. But it's very proud. <laughs> you know, they, There's no armor. Very smart. Yeah. We, if High we're education. This, we're going to do it as a duel, good man. <laughs> yes. But we get yes. lasered in half. If, if he's one of one of those guys who very proudly says, you know, he's experienced in martial arts, and it turns out to be fencing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, there's no argument. I mean, archery, fencing—they are martial arts. There's no two ways about it. There is no other way of describing them. Yep. And yet, not necessarily what people mean when they say martial arts. <laughs> I can do archery, fencing, and uh, Captain Kirk double axe hand <laughs> fighting. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. Yeah, I still have no idea what that was supposed to be. Truthfully, <laughs> yes, they they used it throughout all of them. Like DS Nine and Voyager were still using the double axe handed. Really? Yeah, but Star Trek fighting. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a beautiful thing. I, I I truthfully don't think I've ever really seen it anywhere else except I don't know maybe in the seventies in like. Um, the wrestling ring, you know, Big Daddy and all that kind of thing. Yeah. They they often did various sort of uh, kinds of throwing punches that weren't punches, if you know what I mean, like elbows and things like that. So yeah. it's possible I saw them there. Forearms, yeah. Ah. Yes, forearms, yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Um, but but yeah, that kind of thing. And then you have, of course, heavy weapons. So now we get to the correct spelling of artillery. <laughs> <laughs> um, it begins with an A um, for those who are keeping score um, and then man portable heavy weapons and then vehicle mounted heavy weapons so the idea being it's it's different to be using a an anti-tank rocket that you hold on your shoulder as opposed to one that's mounted in a turret on a tank mm. that kind of distinction mm -hmm. um, so artillery is obviously in this context I suspect intended to be things like indirect fire systems things that can lob a shell over a hill and hit on the other side um because other than that it doesn't really make sense does it to separate out vehicle or and and fixed no so things like mortars uh, and things like that yeah like planted mortars yeah yeah so that kind of thing but not um, in space because that would be artillery <laughs> that would be <laughs> artillery, be artillery. But so it turns you out you can do it on when there's gravity involved. Yeah. You, you gotta have a system. No way, because there's still gravity involved in space if you're firing at a planet. So it, there's got to be the gravity has to be at a right angle to the plane on which you're firing. Yeah. Is that the difference between artillery and artillery? I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you could join. Who us knows? Like you and we've missed you. <laughs> the, the, the weirdest difference has to be. Um, however, the the one the difference between like um, capital ship bay weapons and artillery, because if you think about it, depending on which way your ship is facing at any given moment, if your duty station is on the port side of the ship, you need a different skill from if it's on the starboard side of the ship, mm. because one side of the ship is facing the planet and you need the artillery skill. And the other side of the ship is facing away from the planet, so you need the ship's gunnery skill. Oh, that, mm. that feels a bit faffy to me. Yeah. I, I suspect they're implying, actually, that artillery is something different, like lobbing big meteors down onto the planet's surface or something. That it, it would require different weapons, I suppose. Yeah. And different but... calculations. Mm. Yeah. We've got, so, we've got a couple of people that yeah, use sorry. heavy weapons. Because I, oh, yeah. I believe Stefan can and Soraya can, even though she's weak. I, I yeah. believe they've both got heavy weapons. 
killed. And uh, Agnar has. Oh, what's he one. got? He's got vehicle zero. Ah, uh, the vehicle. So not not. You know, I'm not sure whether zeros actually count, but he can definitely do it without um, any major penalty to his role. Mm. Um, and Stefan's got artillery zero and man portable one. Oh, Fantastic. Sarai's got man portable. Oh, just man. Nice. I think I just wrote man guns. Yeah, man guns. <laughs> I think I've think uh, yeah, been watching some Schwarzenegger port. the night before. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it, it it is weird how many Schwarzenegger movies have him carrying around a minigun as a weapon. <laughs> That's the dream. Um, That's the rise dream. Yeah. <laughs> For those who don't know, there is no such thing in the real world as a man portable minigun. <laughs> they do not exist. Even if you are not Schwarzenegger. <laughs> or Jesse Ventura. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah. I mean, t- technically, I, I think he was able to actually lift an actual minigun for the purposes of shooting it on, on the film but not the power pack to power the actual barrel rotation and the ammunition feed and all the rest, which had to be carefully mounted around him on the ground so it fed in. And then, of course, it didn't have any recoil because it was firing blanks. <laughs> the recoil from firing, whatever it is, 7,000 rifle bullets a minute would be quite oh substantial. Goodness. Can you imagine? <laughs> yes, and at some point on the way up, you'd probably hit the resonant frequency for his arms and they're just full off because <laughs> <laughs> it takes a bit of time to get up to speed doesn't it so yeah, yeah. It winds up. yes it it's a weird thing it's, it's, a, it's a gatling type gun isn't it so so it sort of spins up <laughs> <laughs> and the answer's yeah. yes it is it, it is a well i'm sure it's an impressive looking thing to to imagine someone holding it but uh you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> looks good. They're very, not, looks very good, heavy and you real. can't carry all the gubbins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. So we move on to actually one that we use um, quite a lot on occasions, the investigate check, um, which is actually examining something up close or, you know, looking around for something. And we have used that from time to time um, where you've gone hunting through an office for, information or um searching through a computer for for particular stuff in fact i seem to remember on um in orbit around the planet before geeka no before osin sorry kigarisa kigarisa thank on, you on, on, Rag- it, on ragnar's tail mm-hmm. <laughs> i'm pretty Coming sure you ended up with kind of the wrong person using the tool to break into a computer and search it because the right person was at a, at a dinner. Yes. And there's some and schmoozing you, of the mat, schmoozing of the captain and the wrong person broke yeah. him. Yeah. And so you actually talked me into letting you use an investigate check rather than a, rather than a computer check. Once the thing was cracked by the hacking device. Uh, um, good times. Yeah. Yeah, very good time. But yes, that, that that's a biggie. And and after investigate, which obviously again is something that there might be, depending on what you're doing, it could easily be investigate endurance, investigate intellect, investigate mm. dexterity. You know, there's lots of different options here. Yeah. Um, we then get on to the the game breaking jack of all trades oh. skill. The best skill. Um, which I must confess is probably the referee's favourite skill. Hmm. Favourite? Yeah. There you go. Because having any character in the party with Jack of All Trades means that when you come up with something genuinely obscure that nobody's planned for and everybody's going to be rolling at minus three, you could have somebody who's actually gave, able to go for minus two or minus one. Someone's got a shot. Someone's got a fighting chance when it's important, yeah. That makes sense. Um, so you don't have to panic too much about coming up with something where they where they can't necessarily find a clever way around it because oh, you no. think, it's all right, have, somebody's got jack of all trades. Oh, have they got so, a way out? So it helps you to be <laughs> lazy, I see. Okay. You say lazy, I say... <laughs> Creative. Um, <laughs> They're both the same thing, really. 
or non, non TPK <laughs> is also another good term to use. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but there's another neat trick about the jack of all trades skill, um, and I suppose actually we should explain to people what the jack of all trades skill actually does. Yeah, please do. What the JOT skill does, which and it comes from the original traveler, it always existed, is that it buys you a reduction in that minus three for having no skill. Jack of all trade means that instead of minus three, when you don't have the relevant skill, Jack of all trades is worth minus two instead. And Jack of all trades two is worth minus one. And you can have up to Jack of all trades three, which will give you a flat zero, that, no bonuses, but in dangerous. every possible skill. That's huge. Which is very that's a lot of, but and That's a lot of skills. When it comes to all the different subcategories as well, you know, yeah. like flying, engineering, you can do any of that at zero. At no negative is crazy. But the best thing is you can't train it, can you? It can only happen during the character creation. That's through right. Through previous experience only. Yeah. And the other little secret, the, the dirty little referee secret, is when you are writing up a a character who is going to be more than just cannon fodder for you guys, he's some kind of villain, but he's not just a squaddy. Um, and you think, okay, I have no idea where this story's going to go and I don't know what the players are going to choose to do. But I do know I can make this person a reasonable challenge and an appropriate foil for them if I give them just Jack of All Trades 2. Yep. Because though they're not going to be better than the characters at anything the characters are good at, they're not going to suck so badly they're a walkover. Mm. And if you then play them cleverly, you can find ways of exploiting possible varieties of things that might be weaker for the characters yeah. the player characters uh, but which this this character still gets you know minus one on not minus three on mm. um, yeah so yeah. you you can it's obviously cheating <laughs> but bear in mind when, when you're a referee and you create an npc you don't necessarily know where the story is going you just know what the setup will be and there's mm. a lot of skills that you're going to have to choose from otherwise if if you if you want to come up with half yeah. a dozen NPCs quickly it's a big list to be going through yeah so when you're talking about just a a basic squaddy you tend to say he carries a gun so he's got gun combat one and this one's got that but he's also a bit of a a brute so he's he's got some unarmed combat he's got some some you know some melee stuff um, and then if in the group they've got a pilot, they might have an engineer or a gunner. You know, you, you give them a one or a two in their specialities. Yeah. But the sort of VIP bad guy, you think, OK, he's a politician. He's going to get um, a diplomat skill. He's, he's going to get um, an advocate skill. He's going to get um, a, a social and you know a, a big a big carouse skill that kind of thing yeah. and then you think but he's also got to be a bit of a beast so let's make him surprisingly good with a weapon and give him a gun combat slug of one or two and then just so they don't exploit the huge holes that i've left through not developing <clears throat> up as a properly developed character yeah. let's give him jack of all trades too as well oh, wow. and then he's just going to have to act cleverly in order to exploit their weaknesses <laughs> But I, I, I think those, um, you know, those classic big bad evil guy characters also should know at some point what the party's good at and what they're not good at. And, you know, in theoretically make that exploitable to them. You know, they would have had minions encounter the party or her yeah. tail or done their research. And so they can, you know, stage the final showdown in Ornithopters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should they should they choose? <laughs> Firing I mean, the, all the, guns. The, the simple truth is, it's you know, it, it's like in um, in a D and D campaign where you know that even though technically each of those different categories of damage that you can get, you know, fire damage and cold damage and all the rest, each of those are technically kind of equal. They count the same in terms of the hit points that you lose and so on you know that a typical party is 
extremely likely to be protected against things like fire. They're going to have magic items and they're going to have spells and, and things like that that will protect them more against fire. And very unlikely they'll be protected against poison, comparatively speaking. Mm -hmm. um, though actually poison's not a good example because they'll often have lots of spells and, and resistances to poison. But, um, you know, weird things like thunder damage, they're very unlikely to have resistance to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can kind of exploit the average party weakness <laughs> by, by picking something they're unlikely to be protected against. Yeah. So you're right. Have the final fight in Ornithopters. Um, <laughs> it's always the way. Uh, before we move on, this group does have one person that has Jack of all trades. And I think it's good that it only has one person and not four people. I feel that would be Can a you bit... imagine? We'd all be fighting to fill those situations <laughs> where no one's got oh, a brilliant one skill in it. Yeah. Uh, but interesting, it's Soraya. But Soraya, from when I got a list together of what everyone had back in the day, Soraya has the least skills, if that makes sense. Mm. Because a, a, because in her uh, backstory, a couple of times it did go into Jack of All Trades. So actually, she's got the least specialist things, but she's got this general thing. So it balances. So she's not a beast. I think if certain yeah. people had it, there'd be more of a beast. Especially with their stats. Like Agnar's got pretty high stats on his sort of social education is pretty high so he could be quite mm. a beast with jack of all trades i guess so yeah purely by luck rather than judgment i think it's it balanced itself somewhat i feel all yeah. good game design well, yeah. Good, oh yeah, all good game design. <laughs> I, i'm very I'm so, not, I'm very sorry writers of traveler <laughs> i haven't rolled enough characters to determine which yet but <laughs> so how many game breaking characters you're going to come across I, I i suspect it's probably a little bit of both mm. Like most things, you can you can come up with a character that breaks the game a bit if you try hard enough, I'm sure. But if you if you're reasonably fair, it shouldn't be too broken. No. <laughs> yeah, on average. Is um, and I assume because Jack of all trades basically replaces another role, you're making that role, aren't you? So you still include one of your base stats. Yes. Is that right? So, so in essence, you, you still get exactly that. You still get um, two things to add, mm. generally speaking. Um, you get jack of all trades plus a characteristic. Yeah. And and that um, characteristic could be almost anything. But the way it's actually written. Um, it specifies there's obviously no benefit to having jack of all trades zero. You can't have it. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as jack of all trades four either, because the best you can do is to negate the minus three penalty entirely. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it does say um, in the rules, nothing about which of the characteristics you should go for. Mm. And, you could obviously, in some cases, pick the, the logical one, um, like the, uh, you know, for some it would obviously be dexterity, say, depending on what you're trying to do. But whenever jack of all trades is used in order to replace something significant, I tend to think first it should be education. Because you're picking up a something that you learnt but you don't do all the time yeah I, I mean i guess with the breadth of skills it's impossible that you've got a practical knowledge of everything yeah. even if it's at a minus two you know it would be still pretty difficult to gain a practical knowledge of all of those things it's yeah. probably some somewhat book smarts somewhat so i practical. tend to think jack of all trades should normally go with education unless there's a compelling reason not to Hmm. Um, Interesting. but that's not written anywhere right? that's just how I imagine it working yeah that's hmm. I think that makes sense hmm. um, yes now I, I don't want to worry people but we're only up to L <laughs> I'm, no, I'm wondering whether a part 2 might be, uh, we... might be in order 
It could be a two-parter. I think it might be, because there's a fair few still to go. We've got to get all the way to V, you understand. <laughs> and we've got a few biddy, biggest biddies. We've got a few biddies. We've got a few biggies on the way. Mm, there's, you've got biddies. Melee. You've got Medic. You've yeah. got Survival, Vax Suit. All big, all big ones, streetwise. It's, it's going to take us about 15 minutes. Imagine. There's quite yeah. a few subclasses. <laughs> well, well that, I mean, it's going to take us 15 minutes just to read out the specialities within the science. Scale. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I didn't even bother with that with either, either of mine. I just thought that was too much effort. Yeah. That was brilliant. Yeah, the, the the book says there are a large range of specialities. It's not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so maybe we should actually say Jack of all trades is a good place to break it, and then we will come back and do the other half next time. It is. It's a very well-rounded place to end. I feel Jack of yeah. all trades. <laughs> I'm guessing it's also probably about halfway through the list. Not exactly, but you know, close enough. Yeah, just, and just and it is the thing we promised to get to later and explain why it's different from the other skills, which we have. We did. You fulfilled your. You, it's like writing a good scientific thesis. You said what you yeah. wanted to set out, and you you achieved it. Well done. It's not a very good cliffhanger though. <laughs> to get people coming back for next week. <laughs> uh, right. We've hit. But Jack it is a very good scientific. It's good. It's good thesis. cliffhanger. If anyone can correctly guess what the next one is. Let us know and I'll get you a prize. No cheating. We've had J for Jack of all trades. What is the next skill? Anyone that's watched, drop us a message on Twitter at Boys Baltic and I'll find you a little prize. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's a cliffhanger for you. Are you happy, Ewan? I'm, I'm much happier though. I'm getting straight on, straight on my second Twitter account. <laughs> <Straight on your laughs> <average. laughs> Ewan's not allowed to. What's that usual thing? Any. Any family members or um, former mm. employees are not allowed to enter this. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess thank you guys. And tomorrow evening at ten o'clock is our live play. Mm. Back back on Geeker, on a lake with a with a fish ma- with an elderly fish magnate. Yep. A pretty young lady, and ah, uh, oh, I must, oh, I must hate it. Hated. I don't want to say arch nemesis, but he's our arch nemesis. Our current arch nemesis. He just <laughs> who makes two grand men turn. And if you don't come along the watch, I'll come round your house and read my poem at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the horrors! <laughs> so that means we'll have thousands of people watching tomorrow, and uh, <laughs> so we'll see you all then. So uh, thank you very much for watching, and uh, see you Friday. Good night. Bye.